Welcome back, everybody. Today we're going to talk about EMS systems, and uh, this is chapter two in the book. Uh, and again, uh, this is a little bit more comprehensive than you think, and there's probably a ton of test questions that goes into fundamentals and operations about this particular topic. So make sure that, again, you pay attention to some of these things because, again, they love to sneak these little questions in there. Uh, and again, it, you know, the out-of-hospital components that, that we deal with, uh, again, um, community CPR, uh, it, we have to have the communication systems. We have to know what the levels of the EMS provider are. We talked a little bit about that in Chapter 1. We're going to go into a little bit more extensive here. And then the, the different things that we do, uh, fire, rescue, hazardous materials, uh, throw in their tactical rescue, technical rescue, all these come into play. Uh, we also have, you know, again, we we integrate with several other agencies, fire, EMS, law enforcement, uh, public works, and a lot of people forget about the public works part. Uh, that one, especially during a storm operation, it's kind of common here in Florida, actually. Uh, we also have the in-hospital components, but not only just the emergency room, but the other parts of the hospital, x-ray, um, going to the floors, dealing with the social workers. These are all uh, parts of, of something that we might do as a transport agency. So again, we got to be aware of that. And as a paramedic, we have to know how to integrate with those folks. Uh, again, EMS begins with a citizen activation. I'm pretty sure you're going to see that again. Uh, and the citizen is the one that actually usually uh, activates it. Um, again, we're not talking about you, you pull up on a wreck and you see it, then you call it in on the radio. We're talking about most calls are done via the 911 system. And your dispatchers, again, collect data. They start sending the staffing and equipment. Uh, they they, send, they provide pre-arrival instructions before the, 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 the units arrive to get there. Uh, and again, there's a lot of people that respond to these emergencies, and it's, it's important to note that Again, they usually have some sort of EMR train uh, training, even the firefighter police. Uh, and most of it in our system around here locally, obviously the firefighters are usually EMTs as well. Uh, but you'll be surprised how many of these uh, uh, have additional training in emergency medicine. Um, so remember that your, your dispatcher is going to send an EMT or a paramedic level ambulance. It depends upon the system. If you have a two-tiered system, guys, they, that's why they ask all the questions to see whether or not they need to send an advanced life support or a basic life support unit. Uh, so they can have a tier, that's called a tiered response. Um, and uh, there are systems that use that. Matter of fact, uh, Citrus County uh, uses that as well. Um, one of the arguments that they make is, is uh, can they make an effective determination off of, off of just asking questions? I say for the most part, yes. Do they miss it? Yeah, they do a little bit sometimes. But again, we have to go on what we're told. Uh, paramedic personnel to every incident, regardless of the level of the care needed. Um, again, it, if you've got plenty of paramedics, that's not a problem. What happens if you're in a, uh, a, a large county where you only have maybe 10 paramedics for the entire service? So you, your paramedic resources are stretched very thin. Uh, you, the providers decide on where they go, the type of care that's needed, uh, the time of the transport, and again, your local protocols. And most of these, they have a decision-making tree to them uh, about where we're going to go with what patient. And again, it's your responsibility as the medic to know that. Now, I'm a big history buff as far as, as where did we come from uh, the last 50 years. Uh, and I and I think that it's important to know where the the major milestones were, and going back really 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 far. Uh, again, uh, Napoleon was credited. Uh, there were actually Egyptian litter bearers uh, that they have documented. Uh, Napoleon is the first one that kind of said, "Hey, we're going to bring our surgeons uh, to a localized place, and they bring the battlefield." The, the Napoleon surgeon uh, is actually the one that first did this. And he, and he went out, got the wound, and came back in, started beginning treatment. Um, again, Cincinnati and New York had the first quote-unquote ambulances. But guys, these were nothing more than pick them up and take them to the hospital. Like very, very little, um, very little care was actually done for these folks. Uh, Dr. Frederick Moss was, again, the one that did, first did chest compressions in humans. Uh, the first known air medical transport, again, was uh, done by the Serbian Army. 
Uh, that was back in 1915. Uh, and, and again, that developed to get it even more. Um, so again, again, there's lots of milestones here. Uh, you know, CPR, by the way, became available per se as popular as 1960. And nowadays, you know, we put so much emphasis on doing correct CPR. Um, it really wasn't until the first set of white papers um, having to do with uh, the biggest problem that we were having, in, and that's why actually we're under the Department of Transportation for standards and guidelines, is that a lot of people were dying from trauma uh, and uh, accidental death and disability. That's the paper in 1966, which kind of launched the the emergency medical the highway safety act which initiated emergency medical services uh the 1967 the star of life which is kind of has to be on every ambulance basically uh and then we designed uh in 68 is when at&t designed the the new national emergency number which was 911 uh again i think that's a, a pretty significant milestone um and in 1970 the um i think probably the thing that really helped emergency medicine is the show emergency because it showed everybody exactly what a paramedic did uh and again this was a fire-based system a fire-based ems system and i will tell you this if you guys go back and watch these shows get ready to get scared because of the different types of calls that they portray and we see those different types of calls now it is truly absolutely scary to watch that uh again uh, the, the biggest thing is, as far as moving up, again, the AED started becoming more um, prominent. And in the 80s, they came up with a new a new system of, uh, of trauma life support. Uh, but they have also done that. They, they reallocated funds. And, and a lot of what we do is based upon funding. And nowadays, imagine this, that, that you've got more and more services that emergency medicine now offers. And, uh, again, the funding source for that, and I think that's going to get even better as time goes on because we're going to start going into what exactly um, the, the, of what our role is in, the, in pre-hospital medicine. And I, and I stress that, pre-hospital medicine, not emergency medicine. I think that's one of the biggest mistakes. We've kind of labeled ourselves as emergency care providers when that's not necessarily true. And they go, well, Scott, you know, I don't want to be a pre-hospital care provider. I want to be an emergency provider. I think nowadays those two things go hand in hand. Um, again, uh, the in 2006, they, the emergency services agenda for the future was written. That was kind of like the big last white paper. They rewrote another one back, by the way, in, in 2015, uh, talking about, it's called the 2050 Initiative. And as you can probably guess, um, we're seeing a move towards that, the community paramedics, the, um, the additional resources. The FirstNet is actually based upon, which is FirstNet is the new communication system for first responders uh, that's being built. As a matter of fact, it's almost ready. One of the biggest problems they're having with FirstNet actually is, is the technology is outracing what we thought that it could do, which, again, it's, it's, a, it's a good problem to have. Uh, again, and uh, again, the early development of EMS, again, we had step-by-step -step, uh, instructions for patient care and then how to create medicines. Uh, again, uh, Code of Hammurabi, that, this was for uh, regulated medical fees and penalties. Hammurabi was kind of like their first law system that they actually had. And uh, Dominique Jean Laray, again, that was Napoleon's surgeon. He's the one that first decided on triage and transport. He's the first one that did it. Had a lot more recoveries. We were able to return a lot of people soldiers to the battlefield which again gave napoleon an advantage because he had more troops than the other guys uh again the red cross uh clara barton is the one that organized that during the civil war uh again the first ambulances in 19, uh, 1860 in cincinnati and then manhattan began to operate an ambulance service but again i will tell you it was more of a livery than anything it was delivering patients between hospitals uh, again, the World War One, they used a high mortality be to, to move it out, and then the ambulances were used to, to move your wounded away from the battlefield, give them the proper care they needed. Uh, and again, this uh, it, it went to levels in World War II. Uh, Korean War, they actually started putting the, the surgical hospitals at the battlefield, close to the battlefield lines, where they were able to save a lot more people. Uh, it was, by the way, kind of the first time that air transport was used in a 
major way, but again, they usually had pods on the side of the skids, and they would simply transport them to the to the surgery. Da -da. So again, this is an example of, of the Vietnam helicopters. Uh, a lot of them were medevacs, uh, and again, they used these to, to get the wounded in and out. Uh, a lot of your pilots, uh, the older pilots of today, usually came from this era. Um, and again, now we got a newer generation that are coming into land. Uh, but I can tell you, I've, I've flown with a couple of these guys. They're, they are absolutely uh, incredible what they did. Um, the components of the EMS system is, again, manpower, training, communication, transportation, and emergency facilities. We're going to need all of these things in order to do our job. Uh, and it's kind of branching out into critical care. We've got other public safety agencies that are involved. Uh, customer participation. That's right. Without customers, we're kind of useless. Uh, again, access to care, patient transfers, uh, standardized record keeping, public information and education. Again, another big part of what we do. Uh, disaster management and then mutual aid. We are an integral part in these plans and understand that we are a part of these plans not the overall, hey, we're going to make sure that we see see all that through. And again, in 1988, the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration, uh, they're the ones that came up with the 10 elements of, uh, of these. And again, these look kind of familiar if you look at, the, if you look at that compared to the 15 points of EMS. Um, again, these are the major white papers that were written. Uh, and again, there was a, the, the newest one, by the way, is the 2050 project uh, of trying to advance EMS into the next level and the next thing. Uh, what do you need to have to have um, the attributes, okay? The different things that really make uh, EMS work. Um, and all of these things are required to make things work. And, you know, we, we have to be able to do this and, you know, imagine an EMS system without communication. Imagine an EMS with, without good clinical care. That's kind of scary. And, and again, you have to have all of these things. How do we record our data? How do we collect our data so that we can do our job better? And all of these things come from that. Now, the uh, 21st Century EMS, uh, it's a result of September 11th. They kind of brought this out and they, they realized that EMS still had some ways to go here. Um, and again, the attack on New York City produced a massive amount of wounded. Uh, and again, it, we, we had to figure out what we were going to do it. Um, you know, back in, before this, it was kind of you rushed in, you did things. And now we've kind of figured out, you know, maybe rushing in sometimes might not be a good thing to do after all, especially on incidents such as this. Um, now, again, uh, at the crossroads, it, meaning that what we found out, when we started really taking a good look at what we were doing, uh, uh, our coordination is, it was horrible. Um, the, the transportation within regions, it, it's limited. Matter of fact, I think EMS is still a county by county thing. And I think that maybe that's not a good thing there. there it helps in certain aspects, but there's other things that it doesn't help with. Uh, what if I have to send the task force from here to Orlando and I don't treat the patient the same way? Um, it, it's kind of scary that, that we can do that. Uh, the uncertain quality of care is actually, I think, a big one. And I think that that one's still an industry problem right now, um, that we don't do a good job uh, making sure that we're doing what we're supposed to do. Um, lack of readiness for disasters, I, I think that's a over the over the board thing. Uh, I think the pandemic kind of really proved that. Um, it, I remember used, they, they used to laugh at me because we had a cabinet full of um, – Mask and gowns and goggles and oh you know, we're never gonna need this we're never oh, no, no and then the pandemic hit and then all of a sudden they were raiding our supplies because nobody had any of it and so it it was kind of funny when when I, I heard about this uh and and I, I really did I kind of giggled about it because those are the times where those stockpiles actually pay dividends that's when that's when it works that's the way you have to be prepared um. So again, the, where we're headed towards, uh, we've already looked at the, the record number of helicopter and ambulances crashes with fatalities that happened in 2008. Uh, they, they made some regulation changes. Again, safety is a big thing, by the way, with a helicopter-based system. Uh, very much so. I mean, uh, there's a lot of times that, that people won't fly simply because something's not right. 
Um, so today's EMS, um, there there is a lot of them, uh, but the fire-based EMS system is, is probably your most prevalent. Um, there are some private non-for-profits, uh, third services. Um, uh, third service would be like a nature coast uh, would, would be an example of that. Uh, again, Monroe actually used to have the hospital-based system, so it ran out of the... Uh, Shands actually technically runs a hospital-based system. Uh, there, there are still many volunteer agencies, uh, um, and I'll give you the example. Uh, the uh, Cedar Key actually started their ambulance service because, and it became part of the county service, but they actually started as a volunteer organization. And there can be hybrids of these, so that you can have all different types of these. Uh, back back when we had the Trident trucks, when, when we had those trucks in Marion County, there were four ambulances. We were a hospital-based, but these Trident trucks were the ones that were assigned by the fire department, and, and Monroe paid for the paramedic on that unit. So that would be an example of a hybrid-type system. Uh, chain of survival, again, is the continuum of care once emergencies occur, and it ends with the patient going back to normal. Uh, and again, uh, I think we've all seen this in our CPR classes. Again, it, we immediately, you know, we have somebody go down, we call 911. We, if we need to start emer uh, early CPR, rapid defibrillation, and then getting them to that, the, kind of some the basics of CPR and how it works. So again, all of these things are part of the chain of survival. Um, and with that, and by the way, if just one of those links break, the patient's chances go down. If the dispatcher don't get the call out for seven minutes, that would be an example of when it didn't work. If the pre-hospital care team takes 45 minutes to get there, again, the chances of that person surviving that incident, probably not good. If they don't get them to a definitive care site, chances are they're probably not good. You know, Scott, we got to take them to the closest emergency room. Well, that's not definitive care, okay? Uh, in definitive care, if somebody's having a heart attack, is you get them somewhere with a cath lab. So that would be a, or, or if they have an extensive trauma, we don't take them to Bubba's emergency room. We take them somewhere where we know that they're going to get good trauma care, and it increases their chances of actually living. Now, your public safety answering point. Uh, again, this is the guy's... Uh, it's where the 911 comes into, and it identifies uh, the commitment of services. Uh, and by the way, there are protocols out there where we can identify the, the, the priority dispatch system, where we can identify priority systems and get these people the help that they need, okay? Now, as far as identifying STEMIs and then uh, getting them to a PCI, I think that step still needs to be done by a paramedic. Still need to read the EKG before you can alert. But again, if you know where you're going and you know what's going on with the patient ahead of time, they're having crushing substernal chest pain, the, the story matches, you can prepare all of these things to speed up the process. And uh, trauma is the same way. If you know you got somebody with extensive damage to a vehicle and there's five people laying around it and the one guy's unconscious, uh, yeah, you can go ahead and call the hospital and say, hey, I think we're going to have a trauma alert here in a couple minutes. It alerts the teams to let them know. And again, the more time that we have on that, usually the better. Again, uh, the four levels of licensure, uh, EMR, again, that's your basic uh, basic level uh, first aid person. Uh, EMT, again, we they add a few little drugs in there, but they can do uh, more advanced splinting. Your advanced paramedic uh, is basically uh, can start your IVs, can put in more advanced airways, a uh, limited amount of drugs that they can use, and then your paramedic, again, full full set has a full complement, and that's what we're studying to be, is that paramedic. So, again, we've got a lot more drugs to go over than the advanced EMT. We've got a lot more material that we got to go and, and, and actually have to know. Um, Education-wise, uh, again, uh, lots of educate people's fingers in the pie. Department of Transportation, Department of Education, uh, again, there's standards uh, that the, the National EMS Education Services uh, that they're putting in there. Uh, the National Association of EMS Educators is now taking a more active role in that. So, again, we're getting the training to them that we need to get to them. Uh, local state, state level agencies, remember, they are the ones that govern it. And most of those, by the way, are state driven. However, it's funny because your local protocols are determined by your local medical director which usually serves like in one county area. Um, and again, 
I think that there's a there's a push to go to more towards a regional approach, and I like that approach. And uh, again, the the state EMS agencies, the cool thing about them is is they're the ones that usually collect the data, and more importantly, distribute funds to the different areas. Um, and again, so do you do this under the fire department and public safety, or do you do this under the Department of Health and Medicine? And different states do it different ways, okay? And that's kind of the, the, the major scare of that one. Again, your medical director has got your oversight. Uh, they're, they're legally responsible, and they direct all member, all parts of the EMS health care system. I think that this is a uh, not a right but a calling. Uh, and, again, this is a very tough job, especially in a, in a bigger system. Um, and a matter of fact, uh, you'll see a lot of medical directors nowadays having three or four associate medical directors to help them with these. But again, it's the medical director role. Matter of fact, Dr. Frank here is the one that decides what we're going to do as far as training people. He decides what we're going to do with the, the way in which we teach people. Um, and, 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 and quality and constantly giving us input on where to direct our clinical, our clinical approach to these patients. Again, uh, they, they make sure they interface, by the way, between the EMS system and the healthcare agencies. I think this is a big one uh, because, again, uh, sometimes those in the, in the healthcare system honestly don't know what we do, and that's kind of scary. And, and, and educating them, I think, is very important on what exactly we do and how we do it and the conditions that we do it in. Uh, one of my favorite ones is having a, a doctor scream at me because... I didn't have a patient intubated, and uh, my, my, my scream back was, you know, you're right, you have lights and everybody handing you everything, we really work in good suction, and uh, table level, yeah, you're right, it's really easy to do it this way, um, and uh, matter of fact, I got followed out of the ER for that one, but again, it was my point, you got everybody handing you everything, while you've got good lighting, of course, we don't have that luxury in the back of the truck going down the road 60 miles an hour trying to innovate with a light that we can barely see with. Um, it makes a huge difference, okay? It really does. So, But, again, usually if the, you have these, uh, one of the students the other day said a medical resident. Medical resident comes out and he says, oh, yeah, you know, I had no idea that you guys did this. And that's the point. And, uh, and that's the, the huge big point of that. Uh, your online medical direction, by the way, are the ones that we, we call by either radio or telephone. Um, and there's big, a big trend on this one, not to basically do, when you call in for help to a hospital, they don't want you to do that. And I, I don't disagree with it because there's taking a, a great amount of liability to do that. And so... The good news is, is they've kind of worked around that where we, there's a number now that you can call usually to get a hold directly of your inter, in, of your medical director. You don't have to involve the receiving physician. My biggest problem with doing that is, unfortunately, is um, uh, what happens if the course of action you take that doctor didn't like. Um, and uh, again, I think it depends upon the area. There are some docs that are like, nope, I'm not your medical director. I'm not going to tell you anything. Follow your protocol. Uh, again, it drives me nuts. But again, you should have a way to get a hold of a physician in order to help you make medical direction decisions. Okay, and, and again, if you don't know how to do that in your system, you need to make sure that you learn how to do that. Again, your offline medical control. These are your protocols established in advance, the policies, procedures, uh, and again. It's going to require review, quality assurance to make sure that you're you're using the the tools that the doctor gave you in order to do your job correctly. And again, the protocols. And again, we all function under protocols. Most of us, again, we don't have to call in and get an order to do this, 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 and this. The protocols allow us to do that. Those are are the standing orders, if you will. And again, remember that you are always working under the medical director. He's given you an order. Basically, he's given you a blanket order and said you can do this. You know what? We don't actually have an order on every patient to start an IV. We have a standing order that covers that. Okay? And we're going to leave it off here, guys. I know it went a little long, but uh, we'll leave it and we'll start on the, the four parts of, the, of care on the next one.